and Jill is going to tell us about environmental change along the coast. Yeah. Well, thanks for all introducing yourselves. It's really interesting to learn what you guys are up to. Um, and yeah, so I am currently at UC Davis and applying for a position in ESRM and I've been here <laughs> to 20 minutes. 14 <laughs> hours, well, in this area. Um, and so far I've really loved seeing this area, a little bit of campus today, and I'm excited to get to know more faculty and more students this afternoon and tomorrow. So thanks for coming to my talk. I'm gonna tell you guys about my research program in environmental change along the coast. So as I'm sure most of you are aware, coastal ecosystems are extremely important. Worldwide, 44% of people live within 150 kilometers of the coast. And here in the United States, 39% of people live in coastal counties like Ventura. Um, and in addition to coastal ecosystems, which provide important habitat, nursing grounds, food for all kinds of animals and plants, uh, they also provide important ecosystem services for human benefit, including fisheries and aquaculture and shoreline protection from storms and surges. And as I'm sure some of you will agree, they also provide aesthetic and recreational and sometimes spiritual value for many of us. Unfortunately, coasts are also threatened by multiple human-caused stressors, including climate change, invasive species, pollution, fishing. Um, and this image here shows visually some of these impacts on our oceans around the world. So here, the cooler colors, blue and green, represent areas of the ocean that are, have relatively low human impacts, whereas the orange and the reds indicate areas that have higher human impacts. And you can see in the squared off areas that most of the areas in red, really high impact areas, are along the coasts. So many of the threats to coastal areas, or some of the threats to coastal areas, have diminished over time due to management and policy, but some of them are increasing. For example, climate change is causing lots of associated problems in the oceans, one of which is increases in temperature. So this image shows projected increases in temperature all over the globe, including our oceans, the IPCC, projects that by the year 2100, most areas will experience a two to five degrees Celsius increase in temperature, which uh, can cause all kinds of associated problems for animals, plants, humans. So given that coastal ecosystems are really valuable and important and that they're so threatened, I designed a research program to address the following three major questions. First. What are the current and future human impacts on coastal marine ecosystems? How do organisms respond to those anthropogenic impacts? And lastly, how can we best conserve and restore coastal ecosystems given the answers to the first two questions? So in my most recent research, I have assessed these questions through the lens of the Olympia oyster a super charismatic invertebrate um, <laughs> that is the only native oyster on the west coast of the whole, the whole west coast of the USA and Canada. It's a foundation species that provides habitat for dozens of other uh, organisms, including microinvertebrates that form the base of a really important food chain. They were historically abundant in many bays and estuaries up and down our coast. In fact, in San Francisco, near where I'm from, people during the gold rush ate massive quantities of them, which was part of the problem in their decline, which was due primarily to overfishing and some coastal pollution. Unfortunately, these oysters have failed to recover naturally, and they are threatened by some of the um, current human uh, impacts to the ocean. Restoration of this species is underway in many estuaries along the coast, but there's a lot of unanswered questions about how these oysters can survive given all of the change that's going on. So I am going to today 
tell you guys about three different research projects, each of which is focused on Olympia oysters and addresses primarily one of my three research questions. So the first part of the talk is going to be looking at multiple stressor effects, how multiple human-caused stressors impact Olympia oysters. The second part of the talk is going to look at how oysters respond to that change, whether they can actually adapt to changes in salinity, um, low salinity events, which are quite harmful to Olympia oysters, are projected to increase with climate change. So climate change is causing increased storms, increased uh, runoff from the Sierras and other locations. So it's something that we're particularly worried about in the future. And then lastly, I'm going to tell you guys about a large scale collaborative project between scientists and resource managers looking specifically at oyster restoration in bays and estuaries on the coast. Okay. So to start, we'll talk about the multiple stressor project. So this is a map of San Francisco Bay, and there's oysters distributed throughout San Francisco Bay. And what I did is I looked at a population in the northern part of San Francisco Bay at a site called China Camp, where this nice yellow star is. And China Camp, experience, oysters there experience a number of human-caused stressors, one of which is that low salinity that I was telling you guys about. It's in the northern part of the bay, and up here is this huge delta that drains a lot of water from 40% all, from of California. They also experience high intertidal temperatures, so oysters are an intertidal species. They're affected by changes in the water, but also changes in the air temperature. And what I did is I looked at field data at this location of salinity and air temperature. So on the right, you guys see two stacked graphs the x-axis is time, so it's a time series over two years, 2010 to 2012, and the top graph is a salinity time series, and the bottom graph is air temperature. So first we'll look at the salinity graph, and what I want you guys to see is that over the course of each year in the spring, around April, there is a decrease in salinity. So in 2010 and 2012, that reached around 10 parts per thousand. Just for reference, full strength seawater is about 33, 34 parts per thousand. Um, then you can see in 2011, it actually got down below five parts per thousand for eight days, which is an extreme stressful event for oysters. And at its lowest, it actually approached fresh water, even within this estuary. I want you now to look at the bottom graph of air temperature and similarly what we see is that in the spring we see peaks in high air temperature. Here the blue dots represent mean daily air temperature and the red dots are the maximum temperature. And just so you guys know this isn't air temperature far away from the intertidal. It's air temperature monitored right next to these little oysters and so it's only recording the air temperature that is actually happening when the oysters are exposed to the air. So this is the temperature they actually experienced. And similarly to the salinity graph, each spring there's this peak. In 2010 and 2012, it was around 30 degrees Celsius. In 2011, it got up to 40 degrees Celsius, which is hot, really hot for us and for oysters. Um, the last thing I want you guys to notice about these two graphs is the timing of these stressful events. So we can see that in 2011, the extreme low salinity was really close in time to the high air temperature, whereas in 2010, the salinity, the low salinity event occurred a little bit before that extreme high air temperature event. So given all of this field data and knowing that these two uh, stressors, low salinity and high air temperature, can impact oysters, I asked the following research questions. Is there an interacting effect of low salinity and high air temperature? When oysters experience in them at the same time, is there dramatic mortality or is it not too bad? How does the interaction between these two stressors differ when they're applied coincidentally on the same days or when they're decoupled in time as happened in 2010? So in order to address these questions, I performed a lab experiment where oysters were randomly assigned to one of three salinities, 33, 10, or 5, so control, kind of stressful, and then really stressful. 
three air temperatures, 18 degrees, which is control. They don't care at all. They're totally fine at that temperature. 35, which is stressful, and 40 degrees, which was the highest temperature we recorded in the field during this experiment. And then they were also randomly assigned to one of three timings. So they were either given their salinity and their air temperature on the same day, or two weeks decoupled, so salinity event, then they were given like calm, total happy recovery conditions for two weeks, or a four week decoupling. And this is what we found. So I'm gonna show you a number of graphs all of which have proportion survival on the y-axis and then the treatment on the x-axis. So here, this graph is just looking at low salinity. So this is the oysters that got low salinity or got salinity but paired with control temperature. So in control temperature conditions, what we saw was that only the most extreme salinity, the five parts per thousand on the far right, resulted in significant mortality. So they could handle 10 parts per thousand for eight days, no problem. When we looked at just the air temperature effects, so this was when they were paired with 33 parts per thousand, which is not stressful at all for them, we found similarly that only the most extreme air temperature, the 40 degrees Celsius, resulted in significant mortality. The other two temperatures, they fared just fine. So now I'm gonna show you guys the results when they were given their salinity and air temperature coincidentally on the same day. This graph is similar in that we have proportion survival on the y-axis, salinity on the x-axis, but we're also showing temperature. So the colors represent each of the different temperatures. So here we're looking at control salinity. Again, we see that just the high temperature had high mortality. Adding in these white bars, we see that at control air temperature, it's again only this low salinity that had significant mortality. Now, if we expect that when these two stressors, the low salinity and high air temperature, are applied on the same days, that we expect there to be additive effects, meaning that you can predict the effects of both of the stressors combined based on the individual effects, Additive effects, we would have seen this. So there's a small decrease. For example, if we look at the 5 ppt 40 degrees Celsius, we add up how much mortality occurred because of 5 parts per thousand, how much occurred because of 40 degrees, and we get our new uh, prediction. So this is based on additive expectations. But what we actually found was this, synergistic results. And what synergistic means is that the effect on oyster survival was more extreme than would have been expected based on those additive predictions. So we saw that when oysters experienced both of these stresses at the same time, they were really stressed and died. Um, okay, now adding on the third layer, which is the timing of these two stressors, what we found is that the recovery time, so if they were given two weeks between low salinity and air, or four weeks, that eliminated the synergism and we went to additive effects. So I'm gonna explain that visually now. So again, we have proportion survival on the y-axis, and then we have treatment combinations on the x-axis. So oysters here were given 10 ppt 35 degrees, 10 ppt 40, et cetera and the colors represent the timing treatments. So white is coincident, zero weeks, zero time between the two stressors. Light blue is two weeks between them, and dark blue is four weeks between the two stressors. And I've placed all these white arrows showing you guys that when they were applied at zero weeks recovery time, at the same time, we saw lower survival, but when they were given time to recover after that first stress, the survival went up dramatically. Okay. So what we concluded from all this data was one, that when applied at the same time, low salinity and high air temperature resulted in synergistic effects on oyster survival. And two, latency or decoupling between the timing of these two stressors resulted in a decoupling of effects. Lastly, 
because the timing made such a difference in the oyster survival, we concluded that exploring realistic timing of multiple stressors can be really important for determining how they actually affect species in the environment. So a lot of these multiple stressor studies that have been conducted do so only with simultaneous stressors. And they don't actually pair field data with lab data so that they're accurately mimicking what happens in nature. So this provided us with information about how that other factor of timing might give us information about how conserving or restoring oysters in certain places depends on those stressors. OK. I also wanted to mention that this work was made possible by an amazingly hardworking undergrad named Mickey Takata, who's now pursuing a master's at Humboldt State in marine policy, actually. Cool. OK, for the second part of my talk, I'm going to discuss how oysters are or are not adapted to low salinity. So you can imagine this is northern, San Fran or northern California, some estuaries, Tomales Bay. San Francisco Bay and Elkhorn Slough, the three estuaries that I focused on for my dissertation. And you guys can imagine how oysters in different estuaries or even oysters within the same estuary might be subject to different environmental conditions. So for example, oysters in northern San Francisco Bay, where I mentioned um, the delta drains a watershed composed of 40% of California, which is a big state. <laughs> Um, they can be exposed to low salinity pretty frequently and at extreme levels, like you guys saw in the last experiment. Whereas oysters in Tomales Bay, which is a relatively small estuary that has very little fresh water coming in, might not be exposed to that low salinity. Those different populations, because of their different environmental exposures over time, can evolve um, through natural selection, can evolve different tolerances to these conditions. So even though they're the same species, populations of the same species have different evolutionary trajectories, and different populations might actually have higher tolerance or lower tolerance for some stressors. So given that information, I asked these research questions. Do oysters from different sites within San Francisco Bay differ in their salinity tolerance? And do oysters from different estuaries and different sites within a single estuary vary in their responses to those extreme low salinity events that we're so concerned about now and increasing in the future? So this was my study system. I looked at oysters from four different sites. One site, Marshall, in Tomales Bay, and three sites in San Francisco Bay that have different salinity regimes. And that data is here. So we have salinity on the y-axis and time or date on the x-axis. And what I want you guys to see here is that my four sites had consistently different salinity regimes. So Marshall, which is the site in the less freshwater uh, estuary in the north, had, which is represented by the purple x's, had consistently higher salinity than all the three sites in San Francisco Bay. And then even within San Francisco Bay, as expected based on what you, I told you guys about the differences in where the freshwater comes in, Loch Lomond, which is the site in the north, had consistently lower salinity than the other two sites in the same estuary. So given that environmental differences, um, I wanted to see whether oysters had adapted um, to those differences in salinity. So to do that, I raised oysters through multiple generations in the lab. I collected oysters from the field, raised their offspring to sexual maturity, spawned them, and then raised those second generation oysters. And the reason I went to all this trouble is that in order to isolate genetic effects associated with local adaptation and different evolution of those populations, we had to isolate that from other effects like lasting exposure to different uh, salinities in the field. So what we did is we raised these oysters under common conditions and then we subjected them to different stresses. And if we found that they had different tolerances, then when we would know that that was likely based on their genetics as opposed to based on being exposed to low salinity as a baby oyster and developing um, tolerance that way. So I raised oysters under common garden conditions and then I performed <coughs> 
reciprocal transplants in the field, and lab experiments to address my questions. So again, to answer my first question about whether different sites in San Francisco Bay differ in their salinity tolerances, I performed reciprocal transplants where I took these just adorable <laughs> baby oysters um, from each of the three sites and took them back to where their parents were from or grandparents were from and to the other two sites as well. And then I waited for the winter to happen <laughs> and I assessed their survival. So here you can see me and my advisor um, doing the transplants at Oyster Point and we arranged the oysters in blocks along the shoreline. Each block had one tile of oysters from each of the three populations, so Loch Lomond, Berkeley, and Oyster Point. And if these oysters were locally adapted to their home site, what we would expect is that the oysters from Oyster Point would survive best at the location where their parents came from because they should be evolutionarily adapted to those particular conditions. So what we found is displayed here, and let me orient you guys for a second. So again, like most of my graphs, I have proportion survival on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. So each of these is survival over time during the three-month experiment, and each of the three graphs is one of the locations. So the top graph is what happened at Berkeley, the bottom left graph is what happened at Loch Lomond, and the bottom right graph is what happened at Oyster Point. And then the three colors are the populations, so how each population did at each of the locations. Unfortunately, by the very end of three months, we had a lot of mortality, so it made it, it decreased the power or our ab uh, ability to detect differences. So what we did is we looked at their trajectories over the entire time. And what we saw was evidence of local adaptation at two of our three sites. So at Loch Lomond, we see that Loch Lomond oysters had a better survival trajectory. And at Oyster Point, the Oyster Point oysters did best. At Berkeley, this was not the case. And we weren't totally surprised by this for two reasons. One, Berkeley, as you can see by the end in February, had the highest survival. And what this indicated to us was that Berkeley was a less stressful site for oysters. And this has been confirmed by some of my colleagues. Being less stressful means that they're not under as extreme natural selection to uh, be tolerant for stresses. Lots of oysters survive there. Whereas Loch Lomond and Oyster Point have more extreme stressful events for oysters. So those oysters are under more extreme nat natural selection to have only the oysters that are really robust survive. So that's one reason. The second reason, as you will recall from the map of San Francisco Bay, is that Berkeley's located in the center of the bay between Loch Lomond and Oyster Point. And that means that Berkeley is more likely to receive larvae that swim around in the water column for one to three weeks from both locations. And what can happen when uh, locations receive larvae or genes from other locations is it can mask any local adaptation that has happened there. So this um, pattern of finding local adaptation only at the more extreme sites is actually relatively common in the local adaptation literature. So that's what happened with the reciprocal transplant experiment. Now, to answer my second question of whether oysters from these different sites in different estuaries and within San Francisco Bay vary in their responses to that really extreme low salinity event, I performed a lab experiment. So here I looked at three populations of second generation oysters, raised them for years in the lab, and um, they were exposed, they were randomly exposed to either 33 control salinity, again, or five parts per thousand, which is the extreme low salinity. They were kept in a cold room at 12 degrees to mimic these winter spring temperatures. They were given an eight day exposure, which was based on that field data in the most extreme case in 2011 when we saw oysters exposed to that duration of a low salinity event and based on threshold experiments we did before. And then we assessed their survival after two weeks. So 
This isn't showing the five PPT data yet. They didn't all die. This is just showing you guys the 33 <laughs> for, for beginning. So here we have proportion survival again over uh, salinity on the x-axis. And you can see that at full strength salinity, there was very little mortality and there was no difference among our populations. However, when we looked at five PPT, we saw that the blue bar represents Loch Lomond, the site in the north that experiences low salinity more frequently in the field, those oysters survived better in this extreme environment. Um, it was significantly different than Oyster Point, and the trend was in the same direction from Marshall. So this was really interesting. It showed us that these oysters in the northern part of San Francisco Bay have evolved low salinity tolerance because of their exposure in the field, meaning that not all oysters are created equal. So this has important implications for oyster restoration in the face of climate change. It can help us prioritize sites. So as we mentioned, Berkeley had the highest survival. So when we're looking at sites for restoration activities, that might be a good place where oysters could be likely to survive. It can also help us select broodstock or transplant populations. So because we're worried about some of the stressors coming down the pipe for oceans, like low salinity with climate change, we might want to select oysters to use in a restoration activity that um, are low salinity tolerant. So we, I gave this information to managers to let them know that these oysters from Loch Lomond are low salinity tolerant genotypes that might be prioritized for conservation. Okay. So the conclusions from this experiment were that differences among populations may exist even at these small spatial scales, even within an estuary, and that understanding local adaptation may be critical for restoring in the face of climate change. Again, this work was only made possible by two hardworking, amazing undergrads, Emily Subert and Chris Knight. Okay. Now for the third part of my talk, I want to tell you guys about some work I did with other scientists from lots of different institutions and restoration uh, resource managers. We aimed to provide information about conserving and restoring native oysters within California and along the entire West Coast. So the goals for our, this project were to identify environmental conditions that affect oysters, both negatively, like some of the ones we've talked about today, and positively, what do they need to survive? And then to evaluate, to take that information and evaluate sites for conservation and restoration, and then to provide that information to managers. So what we did is our first step was to interview managers and to find out what they thought was the most critical questions in oyster restoration and see whether we could answer those questions. Then we conducted a literature review to find out what was already known in the literature about what oysters can survive and what they need to, to uh, thrive. Then we conducted lab experiments to fill in those holes in the literature. Then we did field monitoring to find out of those positive things for oysters and those negative things for oysters, were there sites that were ideal and were there sites that restoration was maybe being considered that we were like, no, it's no good. This is bad for oysters. Mm -hmm. um, and then we synthesized all that information, did presentations for managers, and wrote reports and designed online tools for them as well. So I'm just going to show you guys a bit of that work. This summarizes what we found about what they need and what they really don't need. So on the top left, we see biotic stressors. <coughs> These are things that are bad for oysters. Predators, especially invasive oyster drills, uh, which are invasive from Japan and from the East Coast and are voracious predators of oysters. Competitors for space and pathogens like viruses. On the top right, we find abiotic stressors that we found to be detrimental to oysters. So low salinity, like we already talked about, high air temperature, hypoxia or low oxygen, ocean acidification, and then sediment or burial. On the bottom, we see things that they really like. They actually like warm water temperature. They grow faster. Uh, they reproduce better. Available substrate, so oysters settle on a hard surface, secrete cement, and then 
never move again. So they need something to settle on. Um, and the reason there's this little back arrow here is that they provide their own substrate too. So if we already have a lot of good oysters, then oysters settle on top of oysters. And that's what makes them such good um, foundation species. That's what makes them create this three-dimensional structure. And then, of course, they need food, just like all of us. Uh, so we use that diagram of positive and negative factors to then monitor and assess nine sites in Elkhorn Slough and 12 sites in San Francisco Bay to determine, hey, these are great sites for conservation or don't attempt it, waste of money, time. We synthesized all of that into two reports, one focused on California, one that spanned the entire West Coast. And one of the main resources in this report was a site evaluation summary table. Don't try to read this. It's just like a bunch of beautiful colors, but I'm going to explain the key thing I want you guys to take away and how this kind of works. So on the top, don't worry about the words, but each column represents one site. On the y-axis, we have oyster attributes, good things like adult oyster size, survival rate, and then we also have supportive factors and stressors. And what we did is we went down each column and we said, okay, at this site, is it good or bad for each of these things? So dark colors mean good. Dark blue means yay. Lighter blue is like not so good. So you can kind of look and see there's some sites that have greater, uh, a greater number of dark blue squares and some sites that are lighter. And then we weighted each uh, attribute given that some are more important than others, and came up with a score that's represented down here to say dark green, hey, let's try restoration here, light white, it's not worth it. So this was done for Elkhorn Slough and San Francisco Bay, and then we also developed online tools so that restoration managers could do quick assessments of their own sites, sites that we didn't analyze, and come up with this own, their own table. I have a question about that. Yes. Uh, yeah. So the main thing about Elkhorn Slough is that their current populations are super tiny. So one of the main restoration techniques right now is just adding substrate to locations to get natural recruitment. And Elkhorn Slough, um, we're not sure that's really going to happen. So they don't have good adult density. They very rarely we do we see larvae. Um, so for Elkhorn Slough, in the future, they, that might be a good candidate location for supplementation. But right now, the oysters currently there aren't doing that well. Good question. OK. And again, we had undergrads working on this project. Charlie Norton and Kaylee Griffith put in an amazing number of hours um, to help this project be successful. OK, so that's the end of my three project part of the talk. There is a part of my research program that I'm not going to spend a lot of time on today, but I wanted to mention, which is invasive species that I'm really interested in. So I have done a lot of research looking at the Atlantic oyster drill, which was introduced from the Atlantic <laughs> from the East Coast <laughs> when uh, people brought over, once our populations of oysters declined, people still wanted to eat oysters, so they started bringing them in from the East Coast and now from Japan, and there were little hitchhikers on the oyster shells, one of which was this species. So when this species meets Olympia oysters, what we get is death. They are an oyster drill, which means they use their little radula, tongue-like organ with amazingly sharp little teeth. They secrete a little bit of acid, which starts to degrade the calcium carbonate, and they drill perfectly round little holes. If you guys come to the talk tomorrow, I can show you one of those um, oysters with an amazing little hole. And then they eat the oyster body. My research looked at how the oysters respond to this invasive species. So they don't just, I mean, they do just sit there, but <laughs> <laughs> they actually can detect 
the predator in the water through chemical cues and they change their shell morphology, their shell size and thickness in response. This is called an inducible defense. Um, and I'd be happy to talk to you guys about this research. It's something I will present at WSN for those of you who might be going. Um, but I wanted to bring this up because invasive species is one of the things I'm interested in pursuing here if I were to come at, uh, to CSUCI. So here I would like to develop a research program focused on environmental change along the sad Southern California coast. I'd probably still be doing some research up in Northern California, but I have a lot of ideas about how to bring my research down here. One of them is to do some field surveys, monitoring, and experiments to find out about distributions and effects of invasive species that are problematic down here. One of which is this common periwinkle that some of you guys may have heard of. It's not established down here, but it has been spotted in estuaries, and it can cause massive ecological change and damage when it does establish. So I'd be interested in monitoring them so we know more about the distribution and potential effects in our estuaries here. I also would like to continue my work in multiple stressors. So most of my previous work had been done on multiple stressors in the lab. And I would like to now look at how multiple stressors manifest themselves in the field and in other ecosystems besides estuaries. So m one of my ideas would be to set up long-term monitoring sites or use those that I know other scientists have established on Santa Rosa Island, and then take the information about biotic um, variables, how species interact, and also some abiotic variables like pH and temperature and salinity, and then conduct field experiments to see how those multiple stressors actually uh, affect both species and communities, like species composition in the field. I also have a big research goal of integrating my previous work in environmental education with my work in applied ecology. So two of my ideas for doing that are to develop some citizen science projects where undergraduates in my classes or um, who are interested in doing research in my lab would partner with local communities to do some monitoring. Um, I have ideas about doing this with the invasive species and some other um, environmental monitoring. So I'd be excited about this because we could involve local communities. And for this kind of project, I would assess both the scientific outcomes of the monitoring, of course, but I'm also interested in assessing the learning outcomes. So doing pre-test, post-test surveys of the community members who do science with us finding out how it changes their knowledge about invasive species, how it changes their attitudes about the environment, and even maybe their conservation practices. So I've been working with social scientists um, at UC Davis and at the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco, where I used to work, to design some protocols for this kind of research. And lastly, I'm really interested in public perception of environmental issues, particularly ocean acidification. It's something I've done a bit of research on and something that is a major issue for our oceans and something that in general the public knows very little about. So I'd be interested in conducting interviews and then working with students in a class to design targeted education for our local communities. So I talked a little bit about how I'd like to involve uh, ESRM students in my research. In particular, I'd be interested in uh, teaching classes that already exist here with research components, but also designing new classes like climate change along the coast or environmental education for public engagement that would have research components in the class. And I would also recruit and encourage students who are interested in it to take part in research in my lab. Some of my favorite experiences in my dissertation has been mentoring undergrads through the research process. You guys saw a lot of the students that I worked with up here, um, and I've really enjoyed that process, so I would love to do that more here. Um, lastly, I just wanted to say that I've been looking into some funding strategies. So NSF has a particular call out for advancing informal STEM learning, and it's an avenue I've thought about using for my citizen science project ideas and then improving undergraduate STEM education, either to help support some of the classes I talked about or having you guys do research in my lab. With that, I wanna thank all my collaborators on these projects. It took a team of people to do many of these things. I've also had a lot of volunteers and technicians, both undergraduates 
people from the community, family members, all kinds of people <laughs> helped me. Um, so I want to thank them and also thank the funding sources that supported all of this research. And with that, I hope we have some time for questions. Cool.